Hey, great. Thank you, Ellie. We appreciate that. Uh, kids can make their way to Children's Church. We have some pretty good offertories coming up, don't we, Ellie? You and Lucy have one coming up together. I know. That's going to be great. Uh, Sydney, you're doing one for us soon, aren't you? Yes. So, uh, so December, you're going to be on. These guys are going to be on. Uh, Jana, is she here? Yes. And we have you coming up. This is great. Oh, Christmas season, Advent's going to be so much fun. And then uh, for Advent, on the 22nd, we have our youth intern lighting Advent uh, candles, along with the summer youth intern, Ross. So it'll be you, uh, let's see, Jaron, Ross, and then some youth over there. You got to like it when youth get candles in their hands, you just never know what's going to happen. This could be literally the last Advent service ever in the history of the church because of the damage that could, they could do. Oh, there's a lot going on, and you'll get, to, you'll get a, a look at all the uh, December happenings. You'll get that in the next week or so just to see what all's going on. Um, we've been in Joshua. It seems like we've been in it for um, forever. We've not. It's 10 weeks, and it's actually covered 50 years of history, is what Joshua covers. About 50 years, in fact, exactly 50 years of history. And it's coming down to a couple speeches. This one today, and then next week, the final one. You don't want to miss, well, you're not going to miss today because you're here. Don't miss next week. If you have flights, cancel them. You want to be here. It's, it's a great, just an iconic ending to all that's happened in Joshua. This week's speech in Joshua 23, if you have a Bible there, you could flip to it. Today he gathered, Joshua gathered all the leaders in one place to talk to them. And then chapter 24 is his speech to everybody. So this is kind of in-house. This is a little bit more um, the leaders. If you lead a, in a, your home, you're leading on a team, you're leading here at the church, this is you. And we all lead in some degree. He's 110 years old. He has seen a lot and he has done a lot. And he says, okay, and now? I, it's, it's hard to set this up because all that he has done, all that he is, is coming down to this speech to the leaders and then the speech to the congregation. He lived 20 years in Egypt, so hard to imagine, and it's good to think this way, Joshua, same as Moses, very, lots of Egypt in them, culture, custom, training, education. He had 20 years there. Then he had 40 years leaving, Joshua did, and then wandering. And then 50 years in the promised land. And now, it's like, and now here it is. He's literally wrapping the whole thing up. He summarizes for us what we really need to remember. Sarah's parents last week celebrated their 69th wedding anniversary. That is really interesting. I wish we had microphones out here. Some were like, whew. They were like, wow, that sounds rough. Others were like, that's really sweet. Yeah, it's, a, it's probably a nice combination of the two. Uh, 69 years, and they're amazing. They, they raised uh, seven uh, great kids, the youngest, the number of perfection. That's Sarah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She has reminded them of that forever. Like the older sisters, they all had to change tires on the car. They had to learn everything. Sarah, no, she got AAA. It's true, isn't it? <laughs> it was great. They softened a little bit over the years. And uh, 69 years, and you could imagine, anyone in here been married over 50 years? Raise your hand. Over 50. 
No one over 60? <gasps> yes. Yes, there are some amazing. That is awesome. We don't say 70 because that's impossible, right? Yeah, that's got to be. Um, they have a lot to teach. They have a lot to say. So not only is Joshua amazing, he's 110 at this point. And he's crafted for literally his last word to the leaders. And that's what we have going here. If you have your Bible, it's Joshua 23. And Heavenly Father, prepare our hearts right now to listen to these words, the weight of them, to apply to our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Take a look at Joshua 23. So remember last week was the possible coup, the civil war that was averted. So kind of the story's ended, and look at how 23 starts, a long time afterward. So they've had some peace for a while. Joshua's finally able to coast a little bit. He's able to, like, the challenges were largely over, and he was able to enjoy the promised land. Verse 1 of chapter 23, a long time afterward, when the Lord had given rest to Israel from all their surrounding enemies, and Joshua was old and well advanced in years, Joshua summoned all Israel, its elders, heads, judges, officials, and said, I am old and well advanced in years, and then he begins his message. Stop for just a minute. It's the first point in our outline. I want us to look at the setup for this speech. It's kind of a, uh, it's, it's, it's heightening the moment here. One way in which he did it was with repetition. I think it would have been enough to say he was old. How would you like to be introduced like that? This is, insert the name, they're old. But you don't just say that. You say they're old well advanced in years. <laughs> I mean, you had to really make a point to emphasize that. In fact, the repetition, he says that again. Do you see that? It was, he was well advanced in years, end of verse 1, and then in verse 2, he gathered everybody else, and then he said, I am old, and I am well advanced in years. <laughs> a little emphasis there. We hear it, um, it emphasizes things. In the news, you'll hear it a lot if you, we stop and think about it. Um, a BBC reporter just listened to, just recently, that said it was a sudden and unexpected surprise. Yeah, a little redundancy there. Like an armed gunman. Pretty sure a gunman's armed. Why do they say it? It's emphasis. I remember years ago, I was walking through the, an education building on campus, and I was with this fun kid. He was eight years old, a little Romanian kid, and there's people everywhere. And we walked by, and I stopped at the defibrillator and said to him, I said, really? An emergency defibrillator? And this eight-year-old caught on immediately. He goes, yeah, that's weird. It's like a deluxe cheeseburger. He goes, I've never met a cheeseburger that I didn't call also deluxe. That's what it is. And I'm like, you know what I'm talking about? He goes, yeah, it's a defibrillator. What other kind is there than an emergency one? I want the play one. I want the one for every day, just so of a youth event, that we could defibrillate each other. There's emphasis here. I was kidding, Jaron. Okay. That was, that was not, we don't have one of those. We only have the emergency one. There's an emphasis here. I'm old and well advanced in years. That was his, it, it's literally like Billy Graham sitting in front of the fireplace in full mind saying, I am old well advanced in years, now I want to speak to you and I want to say something. You would scramble for pencil and paper to hear what he possibly has to say. It also 
is a setup because it's bookended the entire book of Joshua. What he is saying, he said in chapter 1. This is, this is quite remarkable. Fifty years later, he has the same message. So take a look all the way back to Joshua 1. Take a look at 1 7. Fifty years earlier. He's 60 years old at this point. Verse 7 only be strong and very courageous being careful to do according to all the law that Moses, my servant, commanded you. Do not turn from it, from the right or to the left, that you may have good success wherever you go. We just studied Joshua. We read that now and go, no kidding. That was their mistakes. Every tragedy that happened in the book, they turned to the right or to the left to what they were told to do. That's how we started age 60. Now take a look at chapter 23 in verse 6. Therefore, be strong and keep and to do all that is written in the book of the law of Moses, turning aside from it, neither to the right or to the left. Same message. Let me tell you why that's a little unique. I remember sitting in a class, it was a small, fortunately, a small semester class with a writer by the name of Norman Geisler. There were 10 of us in the class, so we had all semester with this guy who, Christian philosopher and writer. When you get into academics, including your own field, you get into academics and you quote somebody, to be really accurate, you speak of early, middle, or late, at least. You don't just say, Martin Luther said. You typically say, early Martin Luther said this. Later Martin Luther said this, because they can be different. They evolve and they change. Philosophers evolve and change. But we sloppy will quote somebody, I have no idea when they were in their life, where they said it, whether they even believed it anymore. Uh, Dietrich Bonhoeffer is a great example of that. He died at age 39, so there wasn't even a very young, early Bonhoeffer, and not really a late, old Bonhoeffer, and yet his early writings very different than his later writings. You want to differentiate and say, very early Bonhoeffer-like is this. Later Bonhoeffer is this. Joshua, same. What a lesson for us. Our beliefs here at the church, for instance, they will develop, but they don't change. They don't change because society changes. This church, over 100 years old, you look at its doctrinal statement 100 years ago, it actually is the doctrinal statement today. It might be worded a little bit different based on things that are going on and maybe needing to specify, but same doctrinal statement. This is the challenge of the church. The challenge of our church, we have to loosen our grip on methods, but hold tight to message. But those two get confused. We want to be relevant today and see younger people and younger families find a relevancy to us. You change uh, methods. You have to change methods, but don't change the message. And then what we'll often do as a church is we'll, we'll disguise it because we'll say, you can't change that. That's who we are, and we're implying that a method is the message. You've got to know the difference. Joshua's message didn't change. I think it also applies to us individually to know who you are. 
Joshua's waters ran really deep. There were times in Joshua's life that he was against the masses and he stood strong. Well, that's knowing what to stand strong on and what not to. It's quite remarkable. Family, personal discipline. What do you stand strong with? What are those beliefs in your life that you're just, you don't give? This is important. And those things that don't seem to be, are they the right ones? Well, that's the setup of the text. The next point is fascinating because he kind of highlights his message at the start, but then what he does is he reviews God's goodness, sets up, then he pauses for a minute and actually reviews how good God has been. Take a look at your Bible there. So you see that at the end of verse 2, he says, I am old, well advanced in years, and you have seen all that the Lord your God has done to all of these nations for your sake. If you write ever in your Bible, if you highlighted or underlined gently, you'll see how many times he uses the phrase, Lord your God. It is over and over and over and over. Lord your God has done to all these nations for your sake. For it is the Lord your God who has fought for you. Behold, I have allotted to you as an inheritance for your tribes those nations that remain, along with all the nations that I have already cut off from the Jordan to the great sea in the west. The Lord your God will push them back before you, and drive them out of your sight, and you shall possess the land just as the Lord God has promised you. He is reviewing for them all that God has already done for them. I think that's a weakness in my life. I don't think there's enough time spent just reviewing how great God really is and has been. So into the the troubles currently in life, challenges, God help. When we could stop and go, oh, God, you've been amazing. You've been incredible. And he goes, yeah, kind of. Kind of. In what way? That's what he would ask. Really? How? And we go, I don't know, just in a lot of ways. Hmm, okay. So not specifically? Yeah, specifically. How has God been so good to us? He has been so gracious. He has been so kind to us. I thought was, and many of you, this isn't like new or earth-shaking. It was to me where a counselor said to me, for those suffering from depression or you're suffering from anxieties, to have a counselor actually say, in order to change the neuropathways of our mind, which are dark or negative, she goes, the easiest way is through gratitude. I'm like, and that's kind of, that's, that's pretty Christian. She goes, no, no, that's not Christian. That's like psychology and Christian. It's gratitude. Develop and cultivate a spirit of gratitude and thanks to God for his goodness. And rehearse it. And think about it. Because we diminish it with all the struggles that we're in. So it really is. You sit with the paper and a pencil, and maybe it's the back of the McDonald's receipt, and you just sit there and you just start bulleting it. Look how God has been so good to me. And rehearse it and think about it. Because God has been really good. 
It doesn't diminish the troubles or the trials that you're facing. We're not doing that. We're not ignoring the difficulties that you're facing, the past pains that you're still dealing with. We're not, we're not setting that aside. What we're doing first is we're celebrating God for His goodness in getting a pattern within us of gratitude. There's this great English Oh, what was he? He was um, in the, an officer in the Royal Navy in England, died in like 1850. There's a decent Wikipedia page on this guy, um, Alan Gardner. Alan Gardner. In fact, even within the Wikipedia page, it almost was like it's a Christian page, the way they're describing his spirit of gratitude. And I'm like, this is incredible. So because of his years in the Navy, he was pretty experienced um, with navigating a ship. And so he talked to missions agencies. He's turned down galore, finally has access to a ship, a crew. On one of their, or we'll say their last voyage, down to the southern tip of South America, the Picton Islands, in fact, the Picton Islands, the very southern tip of South America, there's a little island. Off to the side, Gardner Island. It's actually named for him. It's how influential he was. 57 years old. There they are, trying to bring uh, development and Christ and compassion to an unreached group at age 57, slowly every one of his crew died of starvation. A supply chain issue, and they're doing what they can, and there's hostility on the main island, and they can't get help. And he died of disease and starvation at age 57. When his body was found a short time later when supplies arrived to find everybody dead, they found his diary right near him. It bore record of hunger and thirst and wounds and loneliness. Couldn't we all write about that? He did. He acknowledged it. They were real. Hunger, thirst, loneliness, wounds, mentally or physically. The last entry in his journal is what he has become known for. In this little book, his writing showed the shaky hand of which he wrote with, and it read his last lines, I am overwhelmed with a sense of of the goodness of God. That was it. His history continues. There, there you can find paintings, posters of ships later named after him. He wasn't legendary, because, but it was so clear what happened to them as a crew, it was so clear in his journal, this cultivated spirit of gratitude and love and compassion that he had for the people he was, it was so iconic of what we want to be like that he became well known. In fact, the Picton Island actually had an avenue named after him from the time, maybe a hundred and some years, and through a series of renaming streets for activists, and many of that's very good. His was changed, but not the island. The little island is still his. So think for just a minute on this. I am overwhelmed with a sense of the goodness of God. Starving to death, the last one alive, and that's what he's consumed with. So then the end now, it's the third, and it's the making it to the point. He set it up pretty well. He reviewed God's fulfilled promises, and then it's here. 
So here it goes. This is it. I mean, it's not a, don't make it an outline. Get the feel of it. Get the mood of this thing. Talks about his promises fulfilled, and then here it goes. Therefore, verse 6, therefore, be very strong and keep to do all that's written in the book of the law of Moses, turning aside from it neither to the right or to the left, that you don't mix with these nations remaining among you or make mention of the names of their gods or or swear by these names of their gods, or serve them, or bow down to them. But you, you shall cling. You're going to cleave to the Lord your God just as you've done to this day. For the Lord has driven out before you great and strong nations. And as for you, no man will be able to stand before you on this day. One man of you puts to the fight a thousand, for it's the Lord your God who fights for you, just as he promised you. Be very careful, therefore, to love the Lord your God. Oh, the the mood of this thing. This is Joshua speaking. He goes, listen, I... We've experienced it. I've told you over and over. Do not turn from the right or to the left of what he has said to do. Don't do it. It's not a don't you do it. It's a please out of, for the benefit of you, your family, and your friends. Please just stay true. And don't mix. Oh, don't stop the mixing. Those other nations, there's some that we allowed. Remember, there's that one that we allowed and they tricked us, so they were stuck with them. And there's others around. Do not speak their God's names. Don't mix with that. Oh, that could be us. What you're watching just flippantly on the phone is mixing with the world. It's, it's, not, it's not funny. It's rude. It's ugly. It's disobedience to God. Don't celebrate that. It's, that is what he's talking about. That is as relevant today as it was back when he said it. Don't mix with the world. We're in it, but we don't have to be of it. Clean that. Well, do I just get rid of stuff? No, you cleave and you cling to Him, to God, and loving God and love His Word. As you and I cling and cleave to Him, it's like literally the pillar, the rock in the midst of a storm as everything's moving and swaying everybody else. It's not going to sway you. In fact, I love the way he said that positively. He said, just as you've been. No, it's not, you guys are all wrong. He goes, no, this is how you are. Live every day with the focus to cling and cleave to God and His Word. And start letting go of those things that are unhealthy. Or the people in your life that are unhealthy. Or the places in your life that are unhealthy. substances that are unhealthy. Let go of those things. Those are of the world. After all that set up, therefore be very strong and keep to all that is written in the book of the law of Moses. Turn aside from it neither to the right hand or to the left. That is exactly what he said in chapter 1. And then he gave us 50 years of history When you don't do it, this is the bad that happens. When you do it, this is the good that happens. We've all lived it, he's saying. And now let's go back to the main thing once again. There are, in your life and mine, we have a hundred priorities. I get it. Um, Financial independence, that's a priority it should be. Um, relationships and family are a priority. Mental health 
is a priority, your education, advancement of your career. I'm getting tired thinking of all of these. We have so many things that are a priority in our life. They're all very important. And too often today, these days, relationship with God, how about relationship with God's people, has become one of 50 things. God's Word, prayer, meditation on His Word has become one of 50 things that we're trying to keep going. Well, we already lost. That's, that model isn't going to work. Under that model, you'll never do it enough. It's never a focus. This is how you can tell. You can actually tell with a little experiment. You take two values. Just pick two. When they conflict, which one wins? As a pattern. Let's be fair, as a pattern. Career and family. Career and family. Both critical values. But when they conflict, which one wins? As a pattern. There are too many men in life who have, of course, health is a priority, right? Health is a priority. But to their career, they will sacrifice their health for their career. Am I right? That's all we do is we take two values, we put them next to each other, and which one wins? The one that wins, Paul Tillich, the old writer, called it the ultimate concern. That becomes, that is your priority. Stop what you think it is and what you say it is. Is God, relationship with God, not turning right to left? Is that a priority in your life? Well, when that comes up against pleasures, when that comes up against your time commitments, which one loses? That's how you and I can go days after days after days, and we can go time and Sunday after Sunday and not be in Christian fellowship and not read God's Word or meditate in His Word and be in prayer. The reason is because you and I don't value it. That's it. It's a lower value because you and I always will always have time for those things that are valuable to us. That's not a problem. I remember early on with the three kids, and they're chaotic, and you're working, and I was working, and, and I thought, how do we, and the phrase we kept saying, we were saying, there are men and women who run Fortune 500 companies the same amount of time that we have. It's not that hard. We're acting as though it's, we're just being killed with, no, you're not. The complexity is in our value system. There's the problem. We will always have time to do what's valuable. And my prayer is that individually, as a church, as a whole, that we remain committed to His Word, to loving God, a heart of gratitude. Not once, not occasionally, but as a pattern that you and I can be strong like Joshua and say, hey, I'll be guilty of a lot of things, but I'm going to tell you one thing I'm guilty of. I stayed true to God's Word. I didn't move to the right or to the left. I will lose my career before I lose that. That, and then the beauty of God's promises, as we focus on Him as our value, everything else falls into place. It fits because it's him and then it's everything else. Do you agree with that? It, right? It is. It's true, isn't it? Stand with me right now. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Will you stand with me? And let's pray together. And I'm going to pray these verses for us as, as you could pray in your own heart and mind as well. Heavenly Father, Please help us be strong and keep to all that you have written in the book of the law of Moses. 
our hearts right now. We're saying we don't want to turn aside from neither to the right or to the left. God, help us to not mix with these nations remaining all around us, inundated with their gods, with their values that are different. Help us to not mention their gods or swear by them or bow to them. But Heavenly Father, we're praying your word that you would help us all to cling to you our Lord and our God. And we pray this in Jesus' name. God's people said, amen. Thank you, John.